Hi, I'm Jim. And I'm David. And And this this is the Practical Practical Guitarist Guitarist Podcast. Podcast. The podcast for people who eat, sleep, and breathe guitar. The Practical Guitarist Podcast is brought to you by Great Lakes Guitar Pickups. Great Lakes Guitar Pickups provides fantasy tones at prices a practical guitarist will love. Featuring top-notch construction, attention to detail, and a fully custom product, if you can dream it, Great Lakes Guitar Pickups can probably build it. Follow them on Facebook at facebook.com slash Pickups. Are you a regular listener? Why not? David here reminding you of all the ways you can participate in the Practical Guitarist Podcast. Subscribe using your chosen podcast app. Review us on iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, or Google Play. Find our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash practical guitarist or on Twitter as at crack guitarist. Support the show. Merchandise is available in our Threadless store at practicalguitaristpodcast.threadless.com and donate to us via Patreon available at patreon.com slash practical guitarist. Reach out to us directly via email at questions at practicalguitarist.com. Hello, Jim. Hello, David. So it, uh, you you sent me an interesting picture today. Um, uh, a, pi- a picture is or it is it a video? No, today earlier. And then I saw Anderson's uh, tweet something, and it was a similar vein. And then I saw a video, and then you sent me the same video because I wasn't sure about the, uh, um, the person that heard. I shouldn't say person, the source of my previous video. But it's the exact same video you sent me. So it seems that uh, your piece, your new piece of digital equipment, may not be as as uh, cutting edge in about two weeks as it was when we'll you bought to, it. We'll have to wait and see. So, if you follow the show, you know I bought a Kemper. Um, I have been anxiously. Uh, Waiting. I'm sorry. I'm chewing. I am chewing. I'm eating, folks. I, it, this is doesn't happen often on the show, but I, I had to snag a bite. Okay, chewy. So, um, here's the deal. Kemper's coming out with a stage, right? Which is a which is a floorboard. Nobody knows anything about it yet, right? right. But everybody's speculating. So I'm gonna do a little bit of speculation. Um, I think this thing is gonna be able to do everything that the the head does currently, except it doesn't have a power amp, right? So, and no option for one um, currently. Well, I mean, you can always add a third party power amp. Huh. Um, but I think this is more aimed at people doing fly dates going direct, right? Um, and you gotta remember, I don't think the powerhead came out when the Kemper originally debuted. I think it came out next, yeah. And then the rack came out, and then the power rack and the rack were together, right? right. Um, and I think the remote came out after, after all of them, yeah. So, um, the reason why this is relevant and important is, uh, this thing, this thing's kind of a game changer for people who have been like looking at the Kemper and going, you know, it's not a floorboard. That's really what it was. Um, and we, we've seen Fractal did the same thing, right? Like, so they had the rack unit yep. and they decided they were going to, they were going to come out with the floor unit, like say now the FM3, yep. um, which is vaporware at this point. Um, uh, now remember I was gonna buy an FM3, and I'm on the list for an FM3, and I still have not heard jack right. about where that thing is, whether that's ever gonna materialize. Um, and I I just laugh because um, I'll get into that in a bit. But anyway, so if the Kemper does everything it should, right? Like meaning it's basically the unpowered head with a floorboard. I think it'll come in at the same price as the regular head, only because, um. Uh, it's missing like one or two outputs on it. It's missing a couple of minor things. It does actually, well, the, the crazy thing is it has stereo returns on it, which the heads don't. Okay. Yeah. So that's kind of interesting. But a lot of people are thinking, oh, well, it's going to it's gonna uh, do two amps at once. Four external no. pedals, two stereo no. return, send and returns. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's got... It's got when you look at the back panel of this thing, it's got everything under the sun on it. Um, and two sets of I don't know. Two sets I think of I think this is a, 
even in 1800, if it's the same price as the 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 unpart head, I think this is a I think this is a home run for them. Um, because there's a lot of people that want this in a floor form factor. I don't think it's going to be 1800, because the the word in the street is that the DSP is different than the DSP they're using in the main guys. I don't know what that means in terms of uh, modeling resolution. And they may be using a slightly lesser DSP. It may not have just quite as good sound quality as the big guys do um, in order to get it a price point that's lower. And that's why I'm kind of wondering if there, if there may be some reduced functionality inside the unit, like it won't do certain, certain, uh, certain types of effects or something um, <clears throat> as a trade-off to get it under a price point. Um, because I because if you look, the AX8 is significantly less than the than the um, the big boy X of X3, and the FM3 is going to be significantly less than the X of X3 as well, by about a, thousand, a little over a thousand dollars. And uh, I think Kemper, I think they kind of understand like they are a premium product, and they're willing to sell it for like six seventeen hundred bucks. That, but they also want to compete with Line that's Six. That's what I was gonna say. So that this would put them. If you got that, even at eighteen hundred, you would have this would be competition for a line six. It really would. And the question I have is, when's the little one coming? Oh man, that'd be a tough. One. Because I could see them doing a unit that is nothing but, um, nothing but amp on link. Similar, like similar the, to the HX stomp, only only being. Um, amp modeler. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I'm I'm waiting for it. I could I could see that. But see, this is a unit that literally somebody like me, I could go in, I could put my existing pedal board right onto it, and then just get the uh, the um, pedal controller for it. Done. I don't miss my pedals at all, man. In my my Kemper, like I know it's really funny. The effects are not great. As little as I use them, it's not it's not a deal breaker at all. Yeah, well, you don't you're not using. There's less need to use pedals to get your sound closer to an amplifier and speaker combination. In other words, you're not using drive pedals and things like that to push yourself towards another sound, like trying to make a, a Fender sound like a Marshall. Or where um, that that's kind of what if you look, that's kind of probably the biggest number of pedals is drive pedals, drive and overdrive. And, yeah, I mean, and and the funny thing is that's like the the fewest models in the Kemper. Yeah, but th but that's just it. Yeah, you you've already got models in there. Um, so. It, the fact is, most of these drive pedals are because the amp you have isn't getting where the amp you want. So you're driving the amp to get the amp you want from the amp you have. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? I, I don't. I don't know. If yeah, you're using it to compensate for something that you that is deficient. Right. When you could just pull up an amp that does what you right. want. Right. Like that person that drives a four wheel drive um, jacked up truck, but um, mm -hmm. compensating for something. But anyway, so then <laughs> you got. But then the other the other um, pedal, and that's something that you and I both don't use as much as some people do. And there are people who, especially in the PNW or the Prison Worship uh, teams that do, is that really heavy reverb and that really heavy delay that some people use. And, the, and it can do that. The new reverbs and delays are good enough. Yeah, I'm just saying that, that at that point, they, you know, they being those who, who sniff those corks um, are looking for... Um, something on the level of either the DD500 or, of course, the mothership of the you know, mother load of it all. Um, the, the, it, it helped me out with this one. Kind of John Strymon. Strymon, thank you. The Strymon Big They're Sky, a little... Blue Sky, and all that other stuff. Strymon's getting a little old. Well, it's it's getting long in the tooth, but what it does, it does well. And I've said before, why, why sell, why invest unless you have to because the old tech is there why invest in new tech to do what you already do really really well i think the only um, thing that other that people have complained about with striving and correct me if i'm wrong because i could be totally wrong is 
Dryman doesn't have as many presets as some people would like to have for that kind of thing. How many effing presets do you need? I don't know. I'm not a, I'm not a super heavy. They, I mean, they have at least 100 in them. Do they have 100? Yeah, but are those presets? Yeah. Are they in banks and everything else? No, yeah. it's... So I think this. I think the timeline is just literally one zero to ninety nine, yeah. and it may have banks of additional ninety nine. I mean, it's not like you're saving the sound; you're saving the parameters Correct. of the sound. Correct. So it wouldn't take much to to put decent, you know, storage for that in there. Yeah. We're talking text files. I mean, it's infinitesimal. Yeah. Um. I think the bigger complaint with Strymon is the small box pedals don't have. That's presets. that. Yeah. It, there's a difference. Like um, if you get a blue sky and a big sky or something like that. But that's why they make the big sky. sky so you can get that for the presets. If you want the presets, you gotta pony up the extra hundred. Mm -hmm. Um you know, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be completely blunt. I, I don't care for Strymon products. I think it's hyped like to no end. I've tried Strymon products. Um I I just feel like they're not bad. I'm not I don't wanna I don't wanna throw them into the bus. But they're expensive for what they are. Like, I'm sorry. It, even even Boss, did, and, and I do believe that ED500 sounds better than the, the Strymon uh, timeline. And I, and I think the RV500 uh, sounds better than the than the, uh, the Big Sky. And it's not my love of Boss coming in there. Like, I, yes, I absolutely have a love affair with Boss. Um, but it's, it's more or less just the higher quality sample rates. Same pedal design ideas with like an analog pass through and all that stuff for your dry signal, um, and the the quality of modeling is is on par, if not better. Um, and some of the sounds that the DD five hundred does, I don't think there's a good approximation of that sound over in Strymon land, um, Terra Echo things like that. Um, so I'm not saying like all the Strymon pedals are bad. Like I would like to have an Okapa stand to be honest with you. But I'm not going to buy a timeline. I'm not going to buy a big sky. I think the I think when you once you get into like that that four hundred dollar only does this pedal type deal, you're like you're into fantasy land at that point with whether or not you actually need that. And uh, you know we were talking about Red Shull a couple of episodes back. He has the Strymon Mothership board right with all the big the big you know Strymon big box pedals. And I just look at it as like, why do you need those? Like what? What are you doing that requires 99 presets? And he's like way out there. There are sounds that are not super specific. Um, I think you you haven't you haven't touched any of the Strymon stuff before, right? Jim? No. You had uh, you had the dry pedals, right? Which are which are okay. I mean, that's basically they're, not... they're very conventional, right? Yeah. They're just a dry pedal yeah. with like some switches and knobs, right? But when you get into the um like the the uh, El Capistan. It's actually two pedals in one box because you can hold down buttons and do things with the knobs and then all of a sudden you're controlling reverb and like all these other things that are in the old cap um, because it's because it's digital control. Um, I think there are better values for, for a lot of the things it does. Uh, actually, I'll tell you what I heard. Um, I heard some of the Wampler reverbs, the newer ones uh, at GearFest. They knocked my socks off. I really was like impressed and they were not nearly as expensive. Now, granted, you would probably have to buy more than one pedal to do the, uh, to do the Strymon thing. But I think that having the variety and all of that kind of makes it worth it. Um, I just, I'm not a big fan of the Strymon thing for another reason too. And that is they are getting long in the tooth and they're digital. And so this brings us back to our topic here, which is like what the only reason I'm paying attention to the Kemper is because I am concerned that the Kemper floor, by the way, the stage or whatever they're calling it. Stage. Um, I am concerned that it will devalue my actual Kemper, right? Yeah. Because this thing's going to come out and everybody's going to jump ship. And then all of a sudden my my Kemper, or my Kemper amp profiler with the power and all that is going to be worth less. Not worthless, but worth less. Yes. Um, however, I'm committed. Three years. Uh, I got to stick with this thing for a while. So um, even if they phase the product out, I, I'm i sticking with Christoph Kemper, who says that our sounds will always be backwards compatible. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, and that's, I think that's a, that's a big selling point when it comes to this. 
Yeah, he's been he's been very adamant about that, and he has a track record of delivering that for the last twenty years. So I'm not I'm not that concerned, but I just it's an interesting thing. Well, I can say uh, that on the video now, of course, uh-huh. it's not voiced over. It's all um, a bunch of really cool um, uh, digitally input uh, letters. Uh, but one of the words it says it does do profile. It says profile. So mm-hmm. the the stage. So it. Could do profile. Could I don't know. I don't. I don't it's know. just weird because it doesn't have a uh, XLR. An XLR. It should. Uh, but maybe during profile, it doesn't. Maybe one of the other XLR so jacks can double as an input. That doubles as an input during a profiling. Uh, because you wouldn't use. That's what them I'm. That's what I'm wondering. Or you wouldn't use them for uh, output when you're profiling. Or you got to go to TRS from an X that's from an XLR possible. to do it. Which. I guess if you're, if, again, I don't think this is, this is where we get to what is it aimed to. Like, the one that you have is aimed towards a person that's going out, they're doing, uh, they're, they're going into a session, um, or they're doing a live thing, so they've got it for both. Where this, I think, is really just for the people that are using it on the stage, and they've been priced out of a market that is the people that use the Line 6 Helix. And if you can get it priced in that sixteen to eighteen hundred dollar market, you can compete directly. Com- I think they're going to steal some business completely directly. I mean, right there with the because uh, what is a um, what is a uh, line six um, uh, sixteen hundred right? Yeah, sixteen. The, 16, the full they're line. probably going to be seventeen hundred by the time Trump leaves office. Possibility, and then and then we'll get a new person in. Uh, and then the price will stay the same. Yeah, yeah that, that's true. And the price will stay the same because they can. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just saying, it does say it's a profiler. So I think, though, this is more aimed at those people, like myself. I don't, I'm not going to profile. I might profile my idea, my idea itself. <laughs> that's about it. I mean, what Why? Else? You can download exactly. them. Exactly. I could download that profile, and I could get tons of profiles. So... Um, All right. I think. I think. Let me get real for a minute. Yeah. I don't want to make this a Kemper show, but let me let me get real for a minute. I bought. I downloaded profiles of the Triple Crown. They're not bad, right? And then I went out and I bought profiles of the Triple Crown. Uh, I think they cost me fifteen bucks from. Uh, Sin Mix. Okay. Right. So they're metal specific. They're well. They're supposed to be metal metal flavored, right? And um. I have to say, even though they're very close, like the ones that I got off of the internet versus the ones I got from Synmix, um, they, you can tell it's the same amp, right? Like the same right. circuit. I have to say that buying the bought profiles were way better than the uh, than the, and they and they are different. That that was what I was really getting at, though. It's like two people can have the same deluxe reverb, depending on where that microphone's at, and how they set it up. The profile is radically different. I would think, so. it, yeah, I would think that a specialized one that you spent, I mean, let's face it, it's a couple of dollars. Would you get three of them for $15? Or no, you got, no. You got like, I got like 60, 60 or something. Yeah, for, for $15. You paid like 40 cents a piece or 30 cents a piece for these things. It was like, it's, it's a non issue. Um, and that's, it really is. That's the thing to remember when people look at, at, you know, his free profiles. And it, and it takes me out just like it does with music um, when it comes to somebody stealing profiles. But, um, you know, it, it, if somebody's going to go out, take the time, create a profile, do a good job with it. Uh, who's that guy? Brexit? Brexit? Brit, Brits? Michael Britt. Michael Britt. <laughs> Brexit. No, <laughs> Michael Britt. I mean, he's got some incredible profiles. And you can get some really good stuff. You can do, you can do pretty much everything for uh, Bucks. All right, I'm going to make some people mad. I don't think Michael Britt's all that great. Yeah, but I'm just saying he's got a boatload. Well, right, he does. He makes a lot of profiles. There's people that make a lot more than him, though. And um, I'm going to be honest with you. He uses the same cab for like 80% of what he does. And that's a problem because I'm sorry. I don't want to hear, you know, a Fender Bandmaster through a Marshall cab, which is not what he uses. But I mean, it's, you know, it's a. I know what you mean. 
it's the same thing. Like all this, all of this stuff is done through the same cap. Um, you know, where it would be nice you know, to have that. Yeah, I mean, that's part of the reason why the Sin Mix one was good because they used like eight different cabinets. They said, what are they using? Like six different Mesa, microphones. Uh, four by twelves. Mesa four by twelve, two by twelve, yeah. oversized four by twelve. Uh, they used the stiletto cab, uh, which is the one I love the most. Um, the orange, they used the orange, I think it was two twelves and four twelve. Um, and then a Hesu, yeah. um, and some other, and some other cabinets like that. I think there's a Zilla cab in there and stuff. So it's, I mean, it's got a lot of variety. You, you, I mean, and when you buy one of these packs, that's how it is. But nevertheless, right. So here's my problem, right. So I buy a pack. This is not the first profile pack I bought already. But I will say this, you're investing in an ecosystem now at this point, which means that in order for me to continue to get investment out of my, or get my investment out of back out of this, That's right. I have to continue to use the camera. Pepper. Okay. So when you really start, it's the same thing as like when you buy a phone, right? You start loading apps up on it. Yep. It makes it a lot more hard to leave that environment. It's, yeah. I was going to say, it's kind of like when you get stuck with a lot of iPhone apps. Now, I will say that there are apps that that do cross pollinate, um, and I've had apps that have no problem with cross pollination. But the fact of the matter is, when you start getting down into the nitty gritty, I'll give you an example. Um, uh, in uh, Rocksmith, right? In Rocksmith, if you buy um, PlayStation, a song on PlayStation to learn does not work on your Xbox or your PC. If you buy it for PC, it doesn't work on your PlayStation or Xbox. So the fact is, it doesn't even cross pollinate across Microsoft soft products. So mm -hmm. um, it's an interesting thing. And as you said, they know they being Kemper know that once you buy that stuff, you're stuck. Okay, stuck. Mm -hmm. And and okay, so I bought IRs, right? I'm stuck. I've got IRs that I pay for. I well, pay for. IRs are universal, though. I know, but right? I they are, but I can't. Right now, I can't use them. You have software. Put them in an IR loader. Yeah. I mean, I, I, but but I know what you're saying, right? Right. But I, that's not a walled garden, okay? This is a walled garden. <laughs> no other product but a Kemper right. can use the, K, the KIPR format. But no other product, let's say you got the accident. Same thing. And if you bought profiles, which you could buy, and I shouldn't use the word profiles, um, what for the axe effects? No, the line presets? six. What do they call them? Presets. Presets. If you bought presets on line six, you'd be you'd be in the same. That's why I would I never bought presets. Yeah. And honestly, I I think buying presets is a whole other thing than buying a profile. Yeah. Presets is some guy sat there and took the time to dial in a tone, right? right. And I'm gonna be I'm gonna be blatantly honest. How many of us could sit there and dial in a tone, right? Um. Not I think that is the I, I, it's, Jim. I think that's a lazy approach. I, I honestly, and, think, and, I, I agree with you. I'm just saying that that there are those, just like there are those who can't solder. There are those who can we? They really they we, they don't know the difference between. Then they can't play guitar. No, what are what is the, why are they buying a Helix? If you can't tell the difference, why are you spending the money? I, I, yeah, Jim, I know want, what you're saying. I'm not saying. I'm just saying there's no rational sense to it. You know what I mean? They want it out of the box. They're the same people that complain. All the all the presets. All the all the. Uh, there was um, a guy. All the set presets that come out of the uh, factory are useless. Yes. All right. It, all right. That's right. They are useless. They show you the farthest end it can go. It's up to you to dial them in. Actually, I think some of the presets there in the Helix were pretty usable, and I've I've used some of them no, for just, recordings and stuff. I'm talking about any of those products, and, and, and the fact is that. There are people they don't they can't dial. All right, all right. So here's where I'm going to go with this. So, um, there was a guy uh, at local music store, which will remain nameless, um, who was coming in to buy a katana. Now he was actually coming in to buy what well, basically what he was like. I want to I want an amp that I can get where I can just buy tones for it because I don't I don't want to I don't. I, how did he phrase it? It was, it was, I don't have time to get the tones that I want, right? In other words, I can dial them in, but I'm not going to spend the time to do it, right? So here's, here's why, here's why I laugh. You bought a katana! 
Like, <laughs> what? It's got four freaking amp models in it. What are you? What do you think you're gonna buy preset wise? Exactly. Oh, this 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 graphic EQ is gonna somehow make my amp sound completely different. It's gonna give a total different game structure. It's gonna you know change the way it compresses. Like, what in the hell? I, I now if the guy said I'm gonna do that and I'm gonna get a Helix and do it, I would have shook my head and been like, yeah, good choice. But you're going to buy a katana and you think you're going to buy patches that are going to be like amazing and they're going to redefine what that amp sounds like? Are you on drugs? Like the katana is not that advanced, folks. It's a GT1000. Right. Like maybe a neutered GT1000 for all we know. Yeah, probably be um, GT1. And, and, you know, I could see buying presets for something like a Helix. Maybe. I would never do it personally, but I could see doing that because like, let's say, all right, so you're in a cover band, right? Right. That's what I was going to say. And you play, you play five nights a week and you're playing, um, you're playing, you know, one band one night and then another band another night. That's when that becomes really useful to go buy presets for it. But here's the problem I have with buying presets. We've all been in a venue where you, where you plug your, th your stuff in and you hit the settings you want and it makes your stuff sound like shit. And so if you're using presets for everything and you're not tweaking stuff on the fly and all that and, and not making adjustments as needed. Now, I'm not talking about global EQ. I'm talking about literally going into the patch and making slight tweaks to things like, you know, EQ and compression um, in order to get things to work right, you know, in your, in, in your audio environment, like the listening environment you have, then you're doing it wrong. And that's why, like, these presets, so you're just going to buy them so you can modify them. You're getting a starting point. That's the way I look at it. Here's why I think presets are stupid on, on to, to buy presets for, like, the Helix and stuff. All right. They're, they're, they're just as expensive as profiles. And all the guy does is program something in. It's not like Kemper, where I literally put them, I have to have an audio engineer or somebody with that kind of background to be able to produce those profiles. If you if you want, it's like when I go, it, let's say I'm going to buy Tone Junkie profiles, right? We talked about him on the show before. Um, he he goes to a studio. They have preamps that they run the microphones into, and then they run the preamps out into the into the Kemper so they can color the sound like you would in a studio, right? And they're using some eh, reasonably reasonable mics. So he's got a fat head and an SM57 on most of his profiles. Some of these does with an E906. Um, so I mean. Your average guitar player probably doesn't have an E906 laying around. Right. I'm sure they probably don't have a fat head laying around, which is a ribbon mic. And they definitely don't have like a Neve console sitting there, you know, with, with the right preamps to make things sound sweet. Right. Um, and so I get it. But, but everybody who's buying Helix patches, like, let's be honest. You're buying a patch that somebody else did with the, with just the equipment and just the knowledge that you have yeah. or could have if you take the time to learn to do it. Um, I know there's a learning curve in this stuff too, and that's part of it. Like the guy with the katana, that, I think that's more what it was. I don't want to learn how to use it, but I want to be able to do this. Um, I'm not saying that katana, the, the katana is not a flexible amp and that you can, you can program it. You can do some, some pretty wild stuff under the hood, but it's not it does not give you the flexibility that something like a Helix or even, you know, the old Digitech GNX processor, because I've had experience with those now, um, we have Dan Kish and, and then we use them in uh, that one open mic. Um, I, I want to stress like I, that there's a, there's a difference between Kemper profiles and presets. That's, that's basically what I'm saying. It's like buying a recording versus buying, um, buying the sheet music. You know what I mean? Um, anybody can, you know, deal with the sheet music. You can learn to read music and whatever, and you can and you can look at the sheet music, but you can't do exactly the recording. That it, it's just the recording, like that's the way it is. You know what I mean? Like, um, it would be it would be impossible for you to replicate the exact same thing as that recording. Um, so here's here's the bigger issue I have with buying into the uh, the whole idea of. Um, uh, ecosystems, right? For these products, obviously the financial risk involved, but we, we're in a community of people 
where the value of this stuff is, well, I mean, like any technology. As soon as the next one comes out, yours is worthless. It, it you're not going to make the money back, and you're going you're going to take a severe hit every time a new product iteration comes out. So, case in point, I got a Flexstone three XL when it came out. They were like eleven hundred, and they quickly went down to seven hundred, and then the product lasted about five six years. When they discontinued the product, the prices on them went through the floor. Um. And the funny thing was there was no replacement product for those. So when I sold mine a couple of years ago, five or six years ago probably, I think I got like 150 bucks for it for an $1,100 amp. And that sting was so bad, I kind of swore off like buying digital gear because of it. Because I'm like, if I'm putting money out, like I need to be able to get my money back out of this stuff. It's crazy. I can see That's that. a hell of a rental fee. I can see that. I want to get back to that uh, that thing about buying. So let's say you're in a um, let's say you're in a cover band. We're gonna go back to that that uh, purchasing pro, um, uh, presets. Say you're in a cover band and you're covering, uh, say, twelve different or fourteen different bands in one group, and another twelve, fourteen different bands in another group, and each band had different you know eras and albums. Um, I think it's a good way to get your starting points done if you're going to purchase, like, say, a Helix. And again, I don't think it's a. Uh, yeah, you're going to have to tweak them. You're going to have to tweak them sometimes night for night. You know, every night you're going to have to tweak a little bit. So, I'll get, I'm going to be completely honest with you. This is what happens to me. I find a setting I like and I freaking stay there, and I don't care yep. what band I'm covering. Yep. I don't give a crap. I will find a. I will find a preset, a place. I'll find a, a certain amount of, of uh, EQ. I'll have an EQ for solos up on the high end of the board, and I'll have an EQ for regular playing. And I'll have a um, settings for rhythm, and I'll have settings for music. That's it. That's really it. And uh, you want me to be honest, Jim? Yeah. I know a lot of people that do the cover band thing. You know, run into them, whatever. None of them are doing presets like that. Nope. Or where they've got a song, you know, every song in their set, they have a preset for it. They're just not. Most of them, what they do, they have a, an American amp, like a yep. like a Fender. Fender. They have a Marshall amp in there. Yep. JSM eight hundred usually. Yep. Something like that. They might have a Plexi on the same patch, so they can switch back and forth. Yep. And then they have like. A box, you know, yep. and that's if they're going to play Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, like they kick on the box, right. you know what I mean? Or if they're going to do um, Queen. And it's, it's literally, that's how they set up their, their modeler. And they might have like effects, you know, for each song plotted out, but it's basically the same, the same amp block. So like the same settings, just kick on the next one so I can get the right effects for that song. Yep. And that's how they go through the night. That's right. Because if you're, if you're playing five nights a week, do you think you have the time to sort out which freaking patches you're going to use that night? No way. Could you imagine loading up a set list like that? Like every other night or whatever, you know, changing it. the set list? Oh, yeah, I do. And it was, oh, yeah, but I mean, it drives you nuts, and doesn't it? Every time somebody wants to change the set list on the fly, I'd be like, hold on, because I've got to get to patch 39, and I'm up at patch 72, or I'm down at patch 3. And so I've got to punch, 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 get there. Or I've got to bang, 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 punch, punch, punch. Right. It's just kind of ridiculous, you know? So, you know, we're talking about this. Rich Scholl is a big proponent above the Kemper and the Helix, yep. right? Yep. And I think he has an X-Fex, too. Um, and he's, so he's a YouTube guitar player that, he's not really a YouTube player. He's a professional guitar player that has a YouTube channel, right? Right. And, um. Your definition of professional may vary, but um, be that as may, he he plays with he's a touring guy. Like he goes around and plays with you know, various people, and he does do some studio work as well. well but it's really funny because he much... has a Kemper and he has a Helix, but whenever you see one of his concert footages, they're nowhere to be found. It's I see a Strymon board most of the time. Yeah. I see his like one of his deluxe reverbs or something, or maybe his Gibson Skylark. You know, 
Um, but he's not using the modelers as much as like you think he would, given that he's a professional. Yeah. Um, because at the end of the day, it's just about having the right sound. Yep. Like you don't need twenty sounds; you just need the right one. <laughs> well, yeah, and it's come down to what works for the gig he's doing. So he he's playing with a guy, Josh, something other, pretty much his guitar player. He's been touring with these folks. They go as far as Indiana. I don't think they've gone any further than the, than the Mississippi. Yeah. Um, and, oh no, they've they've done the East Coast before. That's what I mean, the East Coast, but not the West. Coast. Oh, okay, yeah. They don't cross the Mississippi. He's from Atlanta. Yeah, I don't think I've seen anything out west. No, and uh, goes to Nashville a lot. Um, and the uh, and what you said was pretty much it, except when he was doing like he'd do a fly date with this young lady that he backed up for a long time. Yep. Um, yep. It has like a that's the few really times where I've seen hair. the. With the... And she, um, she's got a funky thing. So that's when he'll bring his his helix or his pepper. Yeah, and, that's, uh, that's just for fly date. Thing, yep. Right. And that's it. Other than that, he pretty much lugs his stuff. He lugs it into his, his Jeep. Lugs that over there. But a lot of these guys, and that's something else to talk about, is a lot of these guys have gone from where they're trying to jump off the road. And they're trying to uh-huh. jump on to YouTube. And I don't know if... if what I'm doing is becoming um, the the road of um, the dinosaur, um, or not? I I think it's just a promote. I think it's just promotion. I think somebody like Red Soul knows that if he's not really going to be able to to um, be a big star, you know, on his own. You know what I mean? Like he real he he realizes that. But he want he knows that he needs to be able to make the business deals to keep his head above water, and so in order for him to do that, he has to have some sort of level of celebrity to him, and so he uses his experiences on the road as fuel to get himself on YouTube, so then he can make the relationships he needs to to get the business side of things. Well, I don't know. I think that um, so uh, uh, what's his name? R.J. Ronquillo. He, uh, Ronquillo. he uh, recently left the road. At YouTube full time. I think a lot of these folks are trying to push the get off the road. Yeah, he's the first one I've heard about doing that uh, full time. Well, um, no, uh, Stevie T. Uh, he was never on the road. He used to. He used to gig. He was talking about oh. why he doesn't gig anymore on a, a hey, one of his recent uh, videos. I know. I watched it. Yeah. That's not what he said. He said, "I don't like playing gigs." Yeah, period. Exactly. That's how he said it. Yeah. In other words, I haven't done it a lot. He hasn't. He hasn't done a long time. How could he? He lives out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's that. But I, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Like, yes, you're right. There are definitely people that are using YouTube as a as a tool for themselves, right? But I'm not going to sit here and pretend like Eddie Van Halen's going to stop playing on tour and come and do a YouTube channel. Eddie Van Halen doesn't have to, but a guy like Pete Thorne is pushing more and more towards it. You know, I th- and that's so. Pete is there for the business side of it, and Pete has a lot of money. He has an absurd amount of money. You watch, you look at the gear that he owns. That's not even like a fraction of the amount of money it, it, he's doing that purely for the love of like gear at that point. Because I, now he does have a lot of followers. He's probably monetizing someone. He's making some money off of it, maybe enough to pay for like his work on the channel itself. But in reality. That dude makes bank anyway. He's one of the highest paid session players there is today. So, I mean, you look at the list, or the roster that he's had and done work for, it's ridiculous. Um, oh, yeah, him, yeah. Jude Gold is one, is one of those cats like that, that makes a lot of money just playing stupid. Oh, little Jude, yeah, like Jude hasn't bothered with the video side of things. Right, right. But, but I'm just take, saying, um, like... You take somebody like Tim Pierce, who, was, who has a lot of credits to his name, and he no. wanted to retire too. That was a big push, part push, of that. Pushing that, yeah, the YouTube channel. He talked about that at, at a gear fest, in my understanding. That uh, part of the reason why he's become such a YouTube presence is because he just he was doing nothing but nonstop sessions for years, and then he finally was just like, you know what? I've made a name for myself. Like I've got enough money. I don't have to do this anymore. And so he's just kind of like laying back, and I'm sure YouTube is paying his, paying some of his bills, and he just doesn't care. Like he's got enough money that he'll be taken care of for you know the vast majority of his life, 
when you look at the again, there's another guy, the impressive list of credits, and you have to think like union royalties and all that that he's getting. I mean, off of some of those records that he's been on, it's just absurd. He's got his, his royalty checks are probably more than my paycheck. I mean, and it, it's it's staggering to think that, but because Rhett Scholl probably makes about as much money as I do. You know what I mean? Like he's not. Well, I get the I get the feeling from watching his channel, like that dude is pushing super hard all the time to try and make money because he's one of those people that's like on the cusp, you know, of like being very successful in this business. Yeah. Um, and maybe he maybe he lands the right gig because of his YouTube thing and and does that. But um, I digress. I, I I'm more or less interested in the fact that. You know, yeah, we're going to have two classes of musicians, right? We're going to have the self-performers and promoters, which are these people that are using YouTube and social media. And we're going to have the the traditional, which is the, the side men that really, you don't even know their names. You know, you don't even know who they are. Like, um, I think I think there's an asset part of being somebody like a Rhett Schultz. It's so like, say, he's performing with a young lady. Um, For him, him having the YouTube presence he does is another feather in his cap going into a resume, you know, like for, for joining a band. Like, he, yeah, obviously he's going to nail the, the uh, audition too, but if they know he already has social media behind him and if that can help propel that band forward, they're going to be like, yeah, let's do it, you know? Um, and I think that's, I think it's a double-edged sword. I think it's some of it's, you know, I'm going to monetize, make money off of it. But I think the other part of it is, look, I've monetized, this is how much money I made off of it. I can help you do the same thing. Um, so I, I I don't see a world where we're going to escape social media as being a being a ne- necessary component of music oh, it's a, at this point. Uh, whether you're tweeting or you're uh, uh, using Facebook or whatever to, to push, I don't think that that's... Um, I think if you're not using that, you're living in, in the dark age. And you're definitely... Yeah. Using, no matter how little or big you are. What we, we uh Gearfest two years in a row there were sessions on social media. Yeah, I mean that it, it, that should tell you something right there. And yeah. there will be a third one next year, I guarantee it. Yeah, it's huge. It, it, and, it's and they need to get Mrs. Smith to do it. Yeah, that would be a good a good person to do. It. So yeah, it's very very important. I mean, Mrs. Smith is literally someone who grew her following from the ground up through social media. I yep, mean, absolutely. Viral videos, boom, boom, mm-hmm. boom. and little, absolutely little things that she puts up. Yeah. Yep, I mean it's. Uh, I think that yeah, I mean I, I in fact she hasn't really even had that much material up there. No, when when we when we interviewed her, I I think I watched all of the videos that were on her yeah, every channel. Yep, and it was like maybe an hour's worth of footage. Yeah, I mean it was it was short. Yep, um, but everything that was there was really compelling. Uh, clearly she knows how to put together material, sure. you know, for, for people to like be interested in and get involved and whatever. Um, so I think that's a big part of it. And I think that's something that, that, uh, I think a lot of people miss. So I was like, um, the, the new thing right now is all the vlogging, right? So like Ryan Bruce, for example, has his, you know, riffs, beards, Monday or whatever it is. And oh, I've uh, heard of that. they all do these like, video logs basically where they sit and they, they answer questions from people. And then uh, some of them are doing it live. Like Philip McKnight does it on his live broadcast and uh, Robert does it on his live broadcast. Um, it's Robert from Robert's Street Card Engine, by the way. Um, I, so I see them doing this and I'm like, so wait a minute. You you run a channel on music, but I get to sit here and watch you talk about stuff for a while. Like yeah. what? What is this? And and I, I think it's a shotgun approach to how do I how do I navigate the, well, the thing of social media? I Mrs. Smith, for, Mrs. Smith figured it out. Make compelling content, right? Not a lot of it. <laughs> I think that for so for Philip McKnight and for Robert's Guitar Dungeon, it makes sense because Phil McKnight's videos are about music they're about gear and robert robert's uh, videos are not about music it's about gear so yeah. and i'm not sure what ryan's channel is 
anymore as far as six to tackle home. I guess it's it's kind of a, a, a hodgepodge of it's a podcast. Music. It's a video podcast. Yeah, but they've never really been about music. They Yeah, it's it's like um I would say they're the definitive music culture podcast. Now yeah, I will probably get hate mail from the guys over in the Gear Slum. No, I think, but I, think I, I really think I really think Sixty Cycle Hum is the is the uh, guitar culture podcast because that's unless, the way I look at unless it. Unless the format has changed since I last listened, it was it was um, like news. Uh, um, they would do like uh, uh, inputs from the group of of uh, like Craigslist yeah, it, stuff. And then, and then would, the Craigslist stuff, yeah. Yeah, and then they would talk. So it was kind of like a news program. I liked it mm-hmm. because it was formatted like like um, uh, it had a format. Only, it, yeah, only they weren't reading from cue cards, so it wasn't going to be cue San Diego. So um, <laughs> it, it was kind of stay classy San Diego. So and they're that, they're out there, so that's why I pulled the Ron Burgundy San Diego. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But. Um, yeah, I mean, it was always enjoyable. Um, the show's still fun. They're still doing it. It's still yeah. fun. And, and that's something that I like. Robert's, Robert's um, Dungeon is like um, Bill McKnight's where it's a solo act. And kind of interface yeah, and with the people. Um, I, I got to say. Even, he didn't, his, now what I like about his stuff is he's kind of moved away. Does he even do a podcast anymore? Does who? Wampler even do a podcast anymore? Uh, I believe he's still doing Chasing Tone, isn't he? Does he? Because I know uh, the only one I know about. He quit doing it for a while, and then he came back with Blake Wyland. That's yeah. And I believe that's still. I believe that's still going. Yeah. Um. So, but it, it made sense because this is about pedals and how to use them, and what you would do with certain pedals. And things. Yeah. Well, you know, and the, so there are industry podcasters, right? Like. They're people that actually are part of the industry. JHS that, does one. Yeah. I, so I think Wamplers is the best of the lot. Yeah. Um, and, and there's a reason for that. So Wampler's a genuine dude. Like, if you've met him in person and had a conversation with him, he's just a nice guy. He's a normal dude. Like, I like to make pedals. This is what I do. I, I There's no ego about it or anything. And it's very much like, if you don't like it, you don't have to buy it. I don't care. Well, like yeah, say, I, take I, or leave it. But his videos have the same approach, right? And even even Josh Scott has videos that are kind of like this, where they'll they'll actually bring out a bunch of other people's pedals, right? And try to sell them harder Matter than they sell themselves. Th- yeah, this week's I think he did Wazacraft. Yeah, I saw that. Um, and so this is what this is what's interesting though. This is the behind the scenes narrative, right? So Wampler got a book. A couple of years ago yeah and that book is how to use social media to sell your business i don't know exactly what the book's title is but that's basically what it is right so yeah. it's like and, and and it lays out this business plan for him yeah. where it's like don't sell your products on social media sell yourself sell your brand as right well. and so that's what he's done like he's he's gone to the gone through the roof on it and my understanding is he's been asked to be the case study for the second edition of this book. I can believe because that. He, because his his business has just exponentially grown since he started his social media campaign. Well, when and, you he, think and he about, attributes his success to that. Well, when you think about the success, so there's been a million people who tried to be the Kardashians, but there's only one set of Kardashians. And love them or, love them or hate them, they, they sell what they are. And what they do, and and their fans love who they are, um, and you can take that now in, with music. I don't care what your favorite band is. Name your favorite band, and the reason your favorite band is your favorite band is not because they play lips that no one else has ever played, not because they they invented some sound that nobody else invented. It's because you love who they are and what they stood for. And so, it, for me, like if if I was to ask to, to name who my favorite musician was, it would be David Gilmour. But if oh, I, I thought you were going to say me. <laughs> Sorry. You're my second. And Screw you, you Jim. To ask who you're not even favorite, on the list. <laughs> I know. I'm not on my own list, so that's okay. <laughs> when, when I'm asked who my favorite band is, though, it's ACDC. And it's always been about ACDC and that, and that camaraderie and that, and that thing. So what made it for me was, was every little silly thing. It was the way that Malcolm Young pulled the, pulled the pickup out of his, you know, his um, Falcon. It was the way that... Uh, was it Falcon or whatever? Yeah, the Gretsch Falcon, right? Yeah, 
and and the way that that um, Angus Young wore the schoolboy's uniform and all right, the other right, things right. that went around it. it yeah, was, the aesthetic <clears throat> stuff. It is, and it's about the fact that they whether they they didn't know me from Adam. They didn't. They never met me. I I saw them. Right. Right. So. But you felt like you were part of the ACDC aesthetic. It's just a rush. When rush fans are rush fans because we're die hard, died in the wool rush fans. And I've met plenty of non-musicians at those rush things. They don't know they don't know jazz bass from whatever. But they yeah, they don't really know anything dance. about what's actually going on in the music and why it's interesting. That's right. But but they know they like it. They know so. they love it. And that's that's the thing with, with podcasts too. I think that that the reason that Philip McKnight has the, the fans he has is because, let's face it, he would be a great study, character study, in that here's a guy who, who had a mom and pop shop in um, Arizona. He was, um, he got out of the Air Force at E5, I think, um, Air Force the Army, it might be Army, but he got out of there, he went home to, to Arizona, he opened up a shop, he had a mom and pop, the, the bulk of his mom and pop from his own um, lips was monetarily the the lesson studios, right? And that's true of most of these places. And then finally, he was making enough on YouTube. He said, the "Heck with it! I'm not doing this part. I'm just doing YouTube. I don't have time to do the shop." And he sold the shop. Oh, I didn't know that he sold it. I thought I thought he was just let somebody else run it. No, he sold it to um, he sold it to two other people who I I I don't know if I heard it right or not, but I think the shop is gone now. They didn't do a very good job. Like, I don't know. I could have been wrong. I could be completely wrong, people. So, so please don't. Uh, don't well, me. I mean, I've I've toyed with the notion of uh, opening a music store many a time. Yeah. Um, and it may be something. If if I have a drastic work change, I may go to work uh, selling gear in some capacity. Yeah. Um. Because I know a lot about it. I mean, um. But let's yeah, face I, it. Someone like Philip McKnight, he sat down and he. he he fixed guitars. They they did lessons. He didn't give lessons. He yeah. ran the store. But um, and he sold guitars. So he fixed them and he sold them. So what's his podcast about? Buying, selling, fixing stuff. That's yeah. that's what it is. So it's kind of like the buy and selling modern the, the some modern and fixing blah, break blah, reviewing blah, playing blah, podcast. Yeah. Review podcast. Sue sue me, Ryan. Sue me. <laughs> We we used your uh, we used your um, uh, tagline very poorly. I don't so, think you're I don't think you're listening to the show anyway. Sue me, Ryan. Right, so go ahead. Sue us for every penny we make on this podcast. Um, yeah, oh. we'll, we'll give you all twenty five cents. You can't squeeze blood from a turnip. <laughs> but um, uh, I that that's where um, you know I've looked at what we and I, I can say this because we have so few listeners. Uh, <laughs> But um, we we do have a good number, but not nearly in these in these numbers. Um, I'd love to take the podcast in a direction that isn't. That's why we talk about stuff. We discuss, mm-hmm. and I want to take us in a in a new direction. I'm, you know, I'm trying to get the live music thing and trying to get the the uh, stuff turned up so I could I could do more of recording live music, um, so you guys could see and hear what happens um, in that in that realm. And it's taking a long time. Um, it's not an overnight thing. But if you look at no. those podcasts that are popular, ask Ryan how long he's been doing it. Ask yeah, I mean, so Walter a lot it. of these people already have some sort of video background. Yeah, and they have the and gear. Right, right. Because, it, so, just, now, I'm using an iPhone to record my, my video. That's a $1,500 camera. Yeah. An $1,100 camera or $1,300 yeah. camera. Um, if you really think about it, yeah. right? And if I was using DSLRs, you know, then there's another thousand bucks. Yeah. And you're talking about tripods, and lighting, and backdrops, and all these different things that, that go into And in live music, I can't just leave work. it on a tripod. I can't just leave no. an iPhone sitting on a tripod out there. I've got no. to have somebody manning it, you know? So I've got to have a person on the other end holding the phone or holding the camera. I've got to have some way of... Of doing this stuff, I've seen the um, I've seen the results of some of the things that uh, um, who are we talking about? Resho uh, has had to do. He has like a tripod. I've seen it get knocked. Over. I've seen things get knocked over, blown over, and yeah, because you know, uh, his acoustic guitar is 
Yep. But, so it was, yeah, that was a, that was a pretty, pretty tough night. So, you know, it's, it's all stuff to take into account. So let's talk about Gibson and how old the old people. I, I've seen this lately. We talked about it on our show before I heard anybody say it, but I want to say this. So they, they talk about how Gibson really is only baby boomer stuff. It's only baby boomers buying. Right. And um, I just wanted to come out and say, I think, I think that that's right. I, think, I honestly think it's people my age and they're starting to age out. Yeah. We talked about that last episode. And so what is Gibson going to do when what we were just talking about? And that's where it comes social from. media, but, social they, but they hired Mac, Mark Agnesy. And then, and now and they're they, just like they blew dumping him, him on the side of the river in, in a body bag. I mean, yeah, I, I, I honestly, I'm, I'm kind of sitting there flabbergasted. Here's Mark what I don't get. Had a good reputation. Mark Agnesi got hired on to do what he does best. And then he didn't do a damn single video until that shit we saw the other day. So, excuse my French people for, for uh, So, I, I what, think he's nothing but a pretty face for, for them. He's a puppet. He, but his he contract has made him videos. a puppet. He did videos That's what I'm saying. He's a puppet. For that storm. Like, the they're not going to let him do anything unless they put their fingers up his butt. Well, then you, you hired the wrong guy. You should have just said, okay, we need a spokesman who could show up. And do videos every, I don't know, two months. They needed it. They months. needed an Andy from Pro Guitar Shop kind of deal. Right. You know what I mean? Like, um, they needed somebody who was going to be kind of a loose cannon and do the videos themselves and take control of that side of the business. And I have a feeling Gibson is not not wanting to do that. They're not. Like they're him they're too big a company. So, uh, case in point, right? The CEO came from Levi's. Stop and think. Does Levi's have a social media presence? No. Not for shit compared no. to you know any any of the other guitarist builder let's companies. Look up, let's look up Levi's Twitter account. Let's go into. Oh, I'm sure Twitter. they got. I'm sure they got Twitter. But my point is, like, the big thing right now is YouTube, right? That's what's driving a lot of this guitar community, and I don't really think of Levi's as being on YouTube. That's what I'm saying. Um. So you got this guy, you know, you, you hired this guy that, that, that maybe, you know what, maybe Norm has a social media person that's not Mark Agnes either, right? Levi's, him to Levi's last tweet, one was, this, this media has been disabled in response to a report by copyright by owner. 13 February 2018, pinned tweet. That's their last pinned tweet. So July 11th was the last week before that. And it's just, that's a long time ago. If you think about Twitter, and then July uh, 8th and then July 4th. So it looks like they're on like a four to seven day schedule. It's Twitter. That's not a very frequent that's presence. That's Twitter. That's not Wendy's, okay? <laughs> I know, I'm just saying that. And Levi's is, is partnered with Stranger Things. So my point is, all right, let's see what Gibson has got for a Twitter account. And if you look, uh, Gibson Guitars. I wouldn't be surprised if Gibson's more active. Well, this week they would be, isn't it? Um, uh, Summer Dam. Well, yeah, there's that and the fact that, you know, they had that thing blow up in their face last month. All right. So all I'm saying is it, it, Mark Agnesi should be out there making videos all the time, all the time. Yeah, At least they should be. Week. They should be. They should. They should just let him loose. Okay, here's a camera. Go do stuff. Right. Here's a crew. Here's a camera. Go. Do That's stuff. right. I, I fully expected to see him walking through, going, "Hey, here's the corporate offices." Right. Here's, here's some JC at work. Right. And then him waving over a cubicle or from his window or whatever. No, that okay. company is so out of the hands of musicians. It is still a a a um. Black hole. It is a it, it is a yeah. faceless, nameless thing. People are like, "Oh, I hate Gibson. I still love Mark Agnesi, but I hate Gibson." Mark, you better jump. How jacked up is that? Right. You better jump or tell them, "Give me some power, or I'm leaving. I'm out the freaking door." 
I mean, yeah, because I because his career he is going to flush his career if he stays there. Because yeah, I don't care how big the the um what is it the uh, corporate umbrella is, it's not going to be big enough. If you can't he get a corporate job, parachute, you're, too <laughs> you're way too young. Yeah, you'll need bigger than a than a um, parachute. Um, and then the um, didn't he come from Norm's Rare Guitars? Yeah, he worked for Norm. And I guess Jet City went under. That's what he yeah. Did. Jeff yeah. um, I, didn't, I didn't hear about well, that today. It'll be interesting to see what happens over the next, I would say, next two years to Gibson because the fallout from this, I I initially thought there wasn't going to be much fallout, right? Like I heard, I was listening to the to the debates and stuff. Right. Like, well, you know, the people that are buying Gibson really don't; they're not even aware of this, they're and not. they're probably not. But it's not going to be like, okay, all the baby boomers have to retire before Gibson's in trouble. They're going to start seeing the signs sooner. And they've already had a bankruptcy, which means that they're not on. I don't care what anybody says, investor wise or whatever like that. They are not on good footing. Okay. That's why they have a new CEO. Well, the problem is they're not on the radar of the young of young. And I say young people when I uh, and I refer to anybody between the ages of twenty five people that have that would that would have that kind of money with, between the ages of twenty seven, twenty five, twenty seven, and forty. That's the younger crowd I'm referring to. Because they even think, yeah, they ahead. even uh, announced anything at at Summer Dam. I don't think so. I haven't heard boo. Because uh, usually they don't announce anything at Summer Dam. Usually their line is announced at Winter Dam. Um, but which is why it's been kind of like they don't always attend Summer Dam. I think it's part of the thing there. But um, I don't know. I look. I don't want Gibson to go away. I know that there are people that are like, you know what? They're overpriced dinosaurs and all this stuff. Like I'm not. I'm not that dude. Um, but I do want to see them somehow stay relevant, you know, because if they don't, they are going to go away. Um, no, or at least they will. Somebody will buy the I. So, I yeah, I mean, that that's my thing. I, I told my daughter that this week. We were talking about the Gibson thing. and I said, you know, even if it, Gibson, Fender, any of the big companies, right, that like the big five or whatever, you know, Schecter, not Schecter, but uh, PRS and like those companies, if any of those guys fold, somebody's going to buy that company. It's not like the intellectual property there is worthless. I mean, Gibson has a laundry list of designs and trademarks and which they're trying to defend, by the way, trademarks and all that stuff. Like they have assets. It's that company is, even if it goes bankrupt, will have assets. Somebody will be producing Gibsons. Um, it would be, it would be really funny if it was the company that bought heritage. Um, <laughs> That uh, turns around and and buys Gibson when Gibson finally kicks the bucket, but I I don't think that's going to happen. I think I think Gibson is gonna they're gonna truck along for about ten years. They're probably gonna hit another bankruptcy about ten years down the line. I think I think the the big dark horse here is what's going to happen to retail. So if Guitar Center, um, Guitar Center seems to be seems to be stabilizing, and um, all of that, but I think that. We might see another push from like an Amazon.com buy a smaller version of Sweetwater or something and give these guys a run for their money for their money. And if that happens, I would not be surprised to see Guitar Center close a third of its stores. And that might be enough impact to to start really messing with Gibson's financials again. We'll see another bankruptcy and potentially a sale. And I think so they can't really sell the way that guitar companies use it because they're not privately owned. They're they're publicly traded. But I could see a takeover. I could see somebody buying the Gibson brands and liquidating the garbage because that's what they should be doing right now is getting rid of the stuff that's not making the money, which they do have brands that they own that are losers, essentially. They, they still own Pioneer, don't they? That, I mean, Pioneer is like done. Unless it's like super high end audio, I mean. All I can say is that so I'm I'm looking at 
Gibson's new announcement for an alliance and generation group artist initiatives. Yeah. <clears throat> They're calling it G3. Obviously, obviously oh, you're looking at the stupid pack. I don't want to talk about this too much. because no, I, don't that... want to, I don't want to talk a lot about it. Here's what I want to say about it. It's an ugly black and white announcement. It has no... we, we just got done talking about the, your online presence. And you, you send out a text that looks like it would have been great in 1994. Yeah. Where people were using dial-up. This is, this is horrendous. I actually have to read this. You don't have. This is what Agnesi should have been saying. Yeah. And there's yeah. no. Well, but that's so that wasn't even. I think at this point they're they're trying to play damage control with Agnesi at this point. They don't want him out in front of anybody. So they're they're hiding him in a closet somewhere. Well, he was at Nam this week, but um, they don't really want him making public appearances and stuff right now because of the fallout from the other thing. That whole partner collaboration agreement. That happened because they screwed up and they started suing people. Well, they didn't start suing people. You know what they did. Like, they, they released a video that indicated that they were going after people. And then the backlash. And then all of a sudden, it's we're going into collaboration mode. It was, it was horseshit. And, like, they realized real quickly that they were going to have a real problem on their hands if they continued that crap. And um, I wonder if Agnesi wasn't the one that sat down with... Uh, with Gibson, it was like, hey, you know, with 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 the head of the company, it was like, hey, you know that video we did, all the crap I'm getting for it, and all the crap the company's getting for it. That's the reason we're we're in the mess we're in. Like we can't do stuff like that. All right, here's something funny. I have to swallow my own wisdom because there's about forty NBC videos on Gibson's site. Yeah, but they're not publishing any of them. Didn't get recognized, or I mean, sent to me. Yeah. Someone who follows Gibson and her videos. And they're not and pushing them out and like shoving him, them down everybody's throats and stuff. Him like, talking, well, it should be at least in my feed, him talking about the Les Paul um, 50s models, the 60s models, the 59, the original. Yeah, yeah. I think I've seen a couple of those. Every single guitar. Then him talking about um, uh, recently, though, um, only him talking about their strings. New factory spec strings and oh my god, a tour of the custom shop. And then before that, you got to go back a month or two weeks, I'm sorry, to the G45 uh, uh, and a new point of entry with um, Gibson Acoustic. So I have to listen to it to see if are they coming out with a, with a bargain. Um, I mean, acoustic and bargains are you know, that's kind of two ends of the same sword. Uh, but I'm just saying, uh, other than all those videos about uh, the various guitars, again, really nothing with Ignisi. Well, for a long time. I want to put the nail in the coffin this quickly, but um, go for it. The reality here is that Gibson knows. So let's 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 get let's get back in the the way back machine here for a second. So we've got Juskowitz, right? running the company into the ground, doing his robot crap. And um, they declare bankruptcy. The panic ensues. And then, of course, the obvious choice is to get rid of your CEO because he's an idiot. Um, and he's obviously run the company to the ground. He's been doing it for 20 years. And and uh, honestly, I don't think he really saved the company anyway, initially, because it was like that was the talk. Like, oh, well, the reason why they have so much respect for him is because he saved the company in the 90s. He didn't save the company in the, in the late 80s, early 90s. Guns N' Roses saved the company in the late yeah. 80s, early 90s, folks. Um, don't don't buy the, the BS, all right? There were certain musicians that were starting to play those guitars again, and those musicians took off, and everybody wanted to be them. So they were buying those guitars again. Um, which is really funny because Gibson has those periods where they, like, they're definitely under the radar, you know? Um, but so that happens, right? That's a thing. And then they, they, they have their bankruptcy. They, they fire Jeskowitz. They bring in James Curley from Levi's, right? Like that's what he's known for. And he comes in and like, did anybody even think to tell him like anything about the brand or because 
in in all honesty, what they did was just nuts. Like they basically said, you know what, this industry, we're gonna we're gonna like throw fireballs at this very close knit industry and expect that we're gonna be okay, that we're gonna that we're gonna get respect for doing what we're doing. I, honestly, when I when I when I think about the fact that they hired. Agnesi and then put him in that position like that was a smart move where was the person that made that decision when they decided to do this video because now they're now they're sitting there like with their thumbs up their ass they don't know what to do at this point they're they're announcing a, a collaborative group or uh, 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 agreement thing that looks more like extortion right than actual collaboration uh, essentially the way I'm the way I'm perceiving that is you pay Gibson X amount of dollars. You can use the design, and you have to attach the Gibson name to it when you sell it. So, like, if you're selling a Les Paul guitar, then it has to say Gibson, you know, Gibson Les Paul. So it would be like Sir's Gibson Les Paul, for example. You know what I mean? Like, because yeah. it's their trademark. It's it's. I honestly, my my head is spinning. That's not collaboration. That's you're paying us, so you're a franchisee now. Well, they might do it like um, remember when the Epiphones had Gibson's name on it? It was Les Paul. It was Epiphone Les Paul, and then it was you know they had a little Gibson freaking thing on there. Um, it may I don't recall come that, up. but yeah, I mean that was the eighties. So anyway, it, um, just one more factoid before we move on, and that is. That Gibson's only put out 110 videos in three years. We've done yeah. more podcasts. We did more podcasts in our first year, year than they did videos in three years. That's that's silly. Yes, yes, it is. That's that's what I'm saying. I wonder yeah. what episode we're on now. I probably should count. <laughs> It'd be tough. We'd have to go into we were we were counting them, but we I stopped count. counting a while ago. <laughs> if anybody knows, send me a message. We did. Um, we were doing two a week, and then we did one a week. But um, I know. I so I gotta address something. Yeah. Um, a couple of people in the group, last couple of episodes have been really Kemper and, and uh, Gibson heavy. Right. And I know that this is not everybody's cup of tea, but we, we got to be honest with with our listeners here. A couple of things. Number one, people want to know what's going on, right? right. Like this is a big. This is a big deal, and um. Even if you're not a Gibson fan, like if you're a Fender guy or whatever, like just understand that this affects you because this is basically the other half of guitar players and guitar community that is interested in this, right? right. Um, because let's face it, yes, PRS is out there and they they make up a significant portion of the market, but the vast majority of guitar players would either consider themselves a Fender or a Gibson. Um, and so that's how that's how critical this is. You know, for for twenty years, these these companies are forty for forty years, fifty years. These companies decided the fate of guitar playing, right? Like, they, if you were a guitar, a professional guitar player, you owned a Fender, and you probably owned a Gibson, and then you might have had a couple other guitars. You know what I mean? Like, that's it's this is a staple. This is this is super important to the community. As far as the Kemper stuff goes, it's what I own. It's gonna get talked about. Get over it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's what you own, and uh, you know. So we're gonna have to talk, start talking about Fender and. Uh, I've been, I've been Fender. Looking at some, I've been looking at some gear. Okay, so all right, so I bought something, but it's not a, it, it's because I gotta have it in practice place and I'm practicing now because they got. Yeah, my, my, I'm looking at similar stuff. I'm looking at similar stuff. Um, so I bought a little Fender Princeton, sixty five watt, um, one of my. I'm I'm looking at stuff for our low value low value budget segment. Oh, and yeah, and I gotta order a guitar. <laughs> I haven't ordered yet. Yeah, I'll probably order that the uh, first week of uh, for August next year. That Harley Dent Harley Dented. The Harley Harley Dented. The yeah, Harley okay. Dented. The Harley Dented. Um um so I got a couple of candidates for the low value for the first low value coverage segment. Get them tele pickups installed, Jim. Um I got I got a couple of candidates for the uh, for the low value segment, and um, one of them is a Randall Diavolo combo. 
right? Uh, I can get them used for like 200 bucks. I see them on, uh, I see them on reverb. Um, it's not, obviously that's not like, all right. So here's the deal. We talked about a value segment, right? The idea was that, um, I want to cover stuff that I can get really cheaply for its class, right? So like a $200 amp is cheap, right? That's that's the way I'm perceiving it. Pedals under a hundred bucks, right? Yeah. Um and that's kind of the way I'm I'm approaching this. I know that those aren't necessarily value propositions, but they are well that's the cutoff I would put on like um that's the cutoff I would put on uh whether or not this is a what I would consider a bargain, right? Right. Um so that leaves the Waza line out from from Boss. I can't buy any Waza pedals unless I get them used. Um, but I'm looking at the Diavolo because I'm kind of outgrowing the Katana, the uh, the internal speaker um, mm -hmm. for rehearsal, like city and at this person's house. And I'm kind of thinking like I want to get something with a 10 inch speaker, and I need something that's high gain. Right? There's a lot of options. Um, the other option is I get the red stripe PV, which I'm kind of excited. Like I kind of want to do that, right? Um, red stripe, uh, solid state PV, um, <laughs> like a bandit or, uh, yeah. they, they make another one in between us, a 10 inch speaker, not a 12. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm thinking the Diavolo might win because the Diavolo is all tube and it's high gain. So it just gets super nasty distorted like any other Randalls you could possibly think of. Um, and I've already told, I've talked to a few people and they're like, you're going to buy a Diavolo 5C, like the combo? And I'm like, I'm thinking about it. And they're like, don't buy that, it's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> so if it's bad, right, I'm buying it. And I will say that on this show. I will make it very clear that I'm unhappy with my purchase. So. Um, I'm not. I haven't decided. That's what I, the first thing I'm going to do. Is. But um, I'm. If you guys can think of other things like ideas for, or maybe a piece of gear that you've used that's like really inexpensive, you'd like us to talk about on the show. Uh, let us know. Like, I'm. I'm open to suggestions, and I really want to get behind this idea of like bare minimum budget type stuff, right? And that's kind of where we're going. So, um. I think the first thing we're going to talk about this month is strings and who yeah. makes, who makes the best budget strings. I, I, I could probably, you can't see how I'm pointing at. I could probably list about uh, 20 packs right behind me. Are they earning they balls? They have a sale for three for, three for $10. Are they earning no, balls? Three for five, five, so like that. Three for $10. Three for $10. They were, no, they're not. Or, yes, they're earning balls. <laughs> I'm sorry, Jim. I'm sorry that you wasted your money. <laughs> I bought a whole buttload of while you're on sale. So here's I'm what, going to be the first one to admit it. Here's the criteria. I bought a pile of them. Here's the criteria for a good set of strings. How much they how much they cost you per pack, Jim? Do you know? Three dollars and thirty three cents. Per pack. Per pack. Now you'll get half the string life that you would get out of a conventional set. Right. From anybody else. But you paid fifty percent. So basically, you're breaking even. You just have to change the strings more often. I think you got screwed. <laughs> that's that's uh, my personal opinion. I don't think so. I don't think. Yeah, more labor, more labor for the same shit. I'm I'm just teasing you, Jim. If you like Ernie Ball, you can like your Ernie Ball strings. Um, I personally value strings. So like under, I would say under eight bucks a set. Um. I had, there's some serious contenders if you go like under eight dollars. Um, GHS is a great brand. I have used GHS boomers. I used those for probably five years, um, and they were great strings. They sounded awesome. Um, they were like very smooth feeling, and they play good. Uh, the ones I really like though, and I think the best budget option. If you if you don't if you're as long as you're not talking about nickel, right? If you want to go for nickel, um. It's probably better to go back to what Jim's got over there, that pile of Ernie Ball sack strings. Ernie Ball. Um, 
But if you're not into that, I would highly recommend getting DRs. Now, DRs are more labor because every set is hound wound, so they're inconsistent, right? Some of them are like you when you intonate, you'll notice your intonations off every time you all of a sudden scream. Sometimes, um, I've got them. I've had them consistent enough that I wasn't tweaking every time I changed the set. The reason I stopped using DRs was because I had enough duds. And I got tired of like the whole thing, like, should I call DR and get him to send me another set? Or, and I just finally just said, you know what? I'm done. Um, mm -hmm. But so, where you, it, we've made it pretty well known. Um, my preference is NYXL, right? Uh, those are not value strings, they're very expensive. So, I've actually tinkered around with a couple other brands. The other value set of strings that I actually like a lot. Or Dunlops, the the Dunlop heavy core, mm -hmm. like th their strings are good. I I've, I've got nothing bad to say about them. So um, now a couple couple things, if your strings are individually wrapped, that's a bonus, because I am so sick of the Diodario NYXL. I'm sorry when I pay seventeen dollars for a set of seven strings. And they come in a gray wrap, like a gray plastic, like freshness bag, mm -hmm. and all the strings are in the same bag. I've uh. I've had it. I've had it. I am sorry. I am paying extra. I do not need to throw away strings if I only need to change one. That is ridiculous. I I it, nothing infuriates me more than realizing a string that you didn't put in, like that you didn't put on the guitar. Is now wasted because it's rusted or whatever. Like, you know, three weeks later. Now, who does it, who does that for you? Uh, what do you mean? Uh, NYXL. Oh. When you open a pack of NYXLs, they're all in one freshness bag. A mm -hmm. lot of the brands are doing it now, where yeah. you don't get well, individual the sleeves anymore. Expectation is you're gonna you're gonna replace them. You're gonna get them all to to ground zero. I understand. I understand. They do not sell individuals for NYXL. And I'm sorry, I'm not the guy that's going to go put an Ernie Ball 10 on with a set of other strings because I don't know whether it's nickel. I don't know whether it's, you know, whether it's stainless. I don't know, you know, like I don't buy singles. That's craziness. Um, so that and we're living in a day and age where you can get on the Internet and I can go to a company and I can order a custom set of strings. I can get exactly the gauges I want. Why are more brands not offering that service? Why can I not go to Diodario and be like, look, I need some NYXLs and I need 10 to 64. Or, you know, because I play seven strings. 10 to 64. No, I have to buy the prepackaged set because NYXLs are not sold individually. It's ridiculous. Yep. Yep, and it it's not... So... It's bad enough that I'm actually thinking about switching. Um, and I think DR started going to her freshness pack. They've started putting two strings in the freshness. And I don't care about that. Like, two is fine, right? I could throw <laughs> one string away. It's 10 cents or a buck or whatever it is at the end of the, end of the day. But this whole idea that if I buy a, a $17 premium set of strings and you're going to stick them all in one freshness pack, that's, that's absolutely asinine. And and they're do, you know oh well it's it's better for the environment I'll bet you this damn polyethylene bag is not biodegradable. Oh, I'm sure it's not. I know the wax paper ones they used to use were. Yep. At one time. I. You know I. I tend to. I tend to know that if I if I change the string out of guitar, I take the string I change out. Then I put the rest of the pack in the box, put them in that case. When I get home, it changes. Yeah. But I, I know not everybody's the same way, seriously. Well, no, no, I've, I've actually, to be honest with you, Jim, I haven't broken a string in probably two years, three years. Yeah, and I don't, it, it, the last string I broke, believe it or not, was those darn, um, those super power strings that weren't supposed to break at all. The heck The cobalts. They? No, they, uh, uh Gilbert, Paul Gilbert was bragging about him. So was uh, 
Yeah, I know what you're talking about. And I think they were pretty ball. They were the. They are. Yeah, they are. Um, and they weren't supposed to break, and I broke them. And a buddy of mine broke one of his. And it was two of us playing those balls, and we both broke it. So, yeah. So, Whatever. I don't think string brand preference is important as important as materials. Yep. Um, now, I know the NYXL materials are not what everybody else is using, right? Like, um, now we have these. And we got what we probably have aged nickel, you know, strings and stuff out there. Um, there's been stainless steel over the years and all these different other types of strings. Um, I think if you pick, so like if you like the sound of nickel, is it is it nickel that or or plain steel or whatever like the the old school, um, like they did in the sixties? I forget what they was that nickel pure nickel. Mm-hmm. I think it is. Yeah. Um, pure nickel. Like, if you're into that, then just buy Ernie Balls. Like, because, yeah. I mean, it's pure nickel. Like, you, you don't have to go nuts with it. Now, DR does mm-hmm. make, uh, they do make pure nickel strings. I was not a fan of them. I tried them a couple times. Yeah. Um, I don't know of any other brands, really, that fit into that price category other than, like, maybe Fender. You can get Fender strings. Which I will say there is an advantage if you're using a Fender guitar to use Fender strings. And that is if you've got a Stratocaster bullets, your trem will work better. Because that, that patented shape that fits into yep. the uh the cavity actually does work. Yep. Um and it <clears throat> that's how Ingve Melmstein can get through three songs without uh without having to have a new guitar every song. <laughs> you know, with as much as he abuses the whammy bar. Um, because he uses bullets yep. and it helps a lot. So, yeah, it does. Um, I, I had never used them like for the longest time. And I think I bought a set on a whim, um, a couple of years back and I threw them in the guitar and I went, well, that's different. <laughs> I was like, well, oh, the trim works. I didn't like the sound of them, but the trim yeah. works. But the trim is good. So, all right, well, we're, we're reaching an hour and a half. You got anything else you want to add to this uh, lovely discussion we've had this evening? Um, let's, do, let's do this. Let's promise not to, unless there's some news about the Kemper. Let's, let's promise not to talk about Kemper. Oh, yeah, we're going to talk about the Gibson. Gibson. We're going to talk about Gibson next week, but not the Kemper. Gibson right. next week. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about those two things. Well, no, so I, I do want to take a few minutes to, um, to talk about the topic we kind of grazed and, and didn't really go over. And that is uh, devaluing digital equipment. So we talked about the yep. my Line 6 amp like being worth yep. basically nothing. I have yep. a theory. And my theory is that the reason why so many people have been anti-digital these years, all these years is because value. And that right. there is a lot of people who are just, they will not put the money out because they know that the value won't be there since it's a tech yeah. item. And um, I was having a conversation with Jeff Biaziadecki, which kind of prompted this. And he was talking about, you know, he's got, he's got, um, he has a lot of amps and stuff. He works in a music store. So um, it's easy for him to acquire gear. And um, it's, it's one of these situations where um, he's looking for a modeler for convenience sake, like to be able to pack in his bag and take it with him and do, you know, do things in specific places that kind of thing. Um, And so this is why I want to bring it up on the show. Um, He was talking about like, well, you know, something like a Kemper, for example, um, is really out of the realm of affordability. Now he's on the list for the FM32, um, which is going to be $9.99 when it comes out. So for for reference sake. And uh, he had a a Helix Stomp and he sold it um, because he was going to get the FM3. FM3 got announced and then nothing. Crickets. It's been crickets for about three months now um so as far as we know there's none even made it stateside like this is just not it's vaporware at this point um and so it got us thinking like we were having a discussion today and he goes well i really don't want to spend a lot of money because this is not my primary thing like this is a convenience tool but i wouldn't mind spending money it has to be money for sound quality right and um so bringing us back around to strymon too like that's part of the reason why I won't buy into Strymon because I know that there's going to be a Strymon, a new Strymon pedal platform right around the corner. Has to be. 
and they're gonna upgrade all the stuff that they've done and put it on the new on the new hardware and -hmm. then all the old stuff will probably be collected into some sort of like mega modeler right and you can buy that and if you like the old stuff yeah um that that's my guess. That's that's what I think would would probably end up happening. Um, but I, for anybody who's ever like looked at digital gear, um, you can weigh in in the group. Of course, um, was price a factor for you? Like that's that's the question I have for you. I know I for me it certainly has been. I think it definitely for me it's definitely that's the thing that's kept me out of a lot of this stuff so far has been fret price. Biggest thing has been price versus convenience. And I don't want to, we're, we're in an hour and a half. I don't yeah, right, right. Belabor it too much. But when it comes down to, you know, people are like, oh, well, I've only got to carry this thing. Yeah, but you still got to have stage monitoring, which means you're still going to bring an FRFR. You're still going to have. Yeah, you don't really, there's... you don't really get away from the convenience side of it. No, it's, it, unless you're working with a group that has decent monitoring and you don't need a floor monitor. And they're carrying it for you. Right. Because that's the thing. You're still going to have to haul your PA. You yeah. know what I mean? It's not like it's not like all of a sudden all your gear disappears because you bought a Helix. Yeah. So remember that open mic that I hosted and I hurt myself last time? Yeah, yeah. How, who could forget? Monday. Who could forget? So when this podcast drops, I will have posted it already, but I'm hosting it again. And, and I have to carry all that stuff in and out. Um, and part of it is my FRF. Yeah, you know? and it's like, well, whatever. I, it, you know, you got to do, you got to do, but. Well, don't even get me started on the depreciation of PA gear. Cool. PA gear. Is, yeah, it's is basically worthless than... once it's used. Yep. Yep. I see all these people with all these mixers online, and it's like, you have got to be kidding. Oh yeah, you I sold a, kidding. I sold a, a like an eight channel Yamaha mixer a couple of years ago for like thirty bucks. Yeah. yeah. And I shouldn't have because I need it now, but it, but I sold yeah. it for like thirty dollars because nobody yeah. wanted it. Yeah, nobody. I, nobody's gonna want it. I got that rack. It's still sitting on reverb. Mm-hmm. I'm literally yeah. giving the gear inside the rack away for the cost of the rack. Right. <laughs> and it's and nobody cost. wants it. Yeah. It's it's hilarious to me. Um. So now it's just kind of a joke at this point. I'm just kind of laughing at yep. it. But, well, the nice thing is if you ever need to. Trade something to Guitar Center, you get that ten percent off. Yeah, but I mean, I kind of, I would rather just keep it. I mean, I'm, I, I'm, I, I'm kind of trying to offset the cost of the uh, that that uh, Gator case that I bought. So, right. But actually, now it probably go towards the value segment. So, yeah. Well, oh, that's right. I sold my SG, so I'm going to oh, have nine hundred plus dollars to, oh, or actually yeah. more than that. I think I think I got over a thousand dollars for it. Nice. Uh, for paying for the 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 uh, Kemper. No, that's going to be um, my Kemper is almost paid off. By the way, um, that is going to be for paying uh, uh paying for the next Kiesel, probably. Sweet, sweet. Yes, Kiesel fund. Yeah, and, right, then, and then that's it. Literally, no more guitars for a while. So yeah, I'm still waiting for somebody to give this poor kid enough money to buy this Harley Benton. <laughs> dude, dude, dude. <laughs> so. You heard that song that I put together, right? I didn't get your impressions. We'll do it yes. live on the show. We'll make it part of the next two minutes and sign off. I loved it. I, I thought it was great. I really did. I, I sat down and listened to it. I showed some friends the sat in the song and I'm like, wow, that's cool. There was a couple of have I heard that before or have I heard that you yeah. know, that band? I was like, No, you haven't heard this band. No. No, it's one dude. <laughs> it's um, one guy. And it was so um that's why I need another seven string. But I, we were, so I was, my wife's got video of me playing it the other night. And actually, so normally, you know, when you write music, like you do like a section of time, you do chorus, verse stuff, like when you're recording it. And I just played the whole thing through. And so I can just sit over here. Like I was playing the whole song the other night. And my wife goes, you even, you even wrote out the solo part. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, if you haven't heard it, it's in the group. Um, big news. I may have a vocalist who's going to be working on it. So nice. Yeah. Nice. Well, Well, that looks, that that sounds good. I don't want to know who it is. Uh, somebody, somebody you wouldn't know. So good. All right. Well, I've been Jim. 
I've been David. And this has been Taurus. You practice.